I'm out of all trades, and this is the Sunday Book Circle for The Mere Wife by Maria Davana Headley. This novel is kind of a retelling of Beowulf, an old English epic poem about the death of the old pagan ways and a slightly subversive pumping up of Christianity. That's the theme. Now I'm going to spoil Beowulf, so if you ever care to read it, skip ahead. The plot is that a monster by the name of Grendel has been terrorizing Herod Hall, and Beowulf, a hero from another land with the strength of 30 men comes to help them. He defeats both Grendel and his mother, and when the old king of Herod Hall dies, Beowulf is made king and marries the queen. Many years go by, and a dragon starts terrorizing the land, and Beowulf must fight again, but his men abandon him during the fight. That's a very important point, and he dies. It's a great poem and story, but there are many different translations of it, giving it different spins. Hedley herself is actually creating a new translation, and that's part of where this book comes from, because in the original language, Beowulf, Grendel, and his mother are all described with the same word, apparently, but most translations turn them all into different things, and that bothered her. This is partly where Hedley's intent becomes obvious. She wanted to bring back that sameness between the characters, and to be honest, I often found that overt in The Mere Wife. At one point, I was actually a little annoyed that the same message that Ben and Dana were the same, were both soldiers had fought in the same war was being retreaded once again. It was like, yeah, I get it already. They're the same. For how short the mere wife is, it felt like a lot of the same messages were repeated, maybe one too many times, such as the question of who is the real monster. I felt like images such as Willa seeing the faces of the mothers crack open near the end and reveal their real faces would have had more impact had Hedley had more tact, had pulled back a bit. Tact and the Poets Force by W.D. Snodgrass was a revelation to me, and I know some people don't like it when things fly over their heads or make them work for it, but there is a balancing act between overtness and obscurity that when done well results in cleverness, with the exception of the theme of how soldiers feel a sense of otherness after returning from the war, that had subtlety. Most of the themes in The Mere Wife often lean heavily into the overt side, but when it comes to reference, The Mere Wife leans heavily into the obscure side. Apparently, each section starts with a different translation of the first word of Beowulf, and I had to be told that. At times, the references are a bit cheeky, which can be annoying. I would also hesitate to call this a novel. It's more like an epic prose poem, which I think is cool. I like that aspect. Hedwig's play with language is awesome, so musical, but this also sometimes comes on so strong that the narrative thread is lost somewhat. To talk about that in more detail, I'm going to go into spoilers, but not quite yet. I wouldn't really call this a subversive retelling of Beowulf because the time and place are changed. Circe by Madeline Miller is definitely a subversive retelling of the Odyssey. Wicked by Gregory Maguire is a subversive retelling of the Wizard of Oz, and pretty much all his other work is a subversive retelling of something. But the themes and the actual narrative is so different in The Mere Wife that it feels more like Ulysses by James Joyce, something that uses a previous narrative as a framework for a new narrative. While I didn't like Circe, and I don't like Ulysses, and even though I do like Mirror Mirror and Wicked, I'm more in favor of the framework instead of a subversive retelling, mostly because there's so much more to be done. I believe that why I like Maguire's retellings and don't like Miller's is that Maguire often does more to realize the world he is recreating, whereas Miller relied too heavily on summary. I don't like Ulysses because it's boring and pretentious. The Mere Wife is sometimes pretentious, what with its obscure references, but the poetic prose style, again, kind of saves it from wallowing in flat summary or overly academic quality. Finally, I'm going to get into real spoilers, so now's the time to get off this crazy ride. Before you do, I'm not sure if I would or wouldn't recommend this book. I would definitely recommend it to my college early British lit professor, so if you're watching, take a chance on this one. So now, spoilers. Get off this train, or skip ahead. Up until Ben found Dylan, the narrative thread was strong and interesting. Then, like in Beowulf, we get a rush through the years, and it was at this point that I felt like the narrative force was lost. My engagement went down, and the final two confrontations felt far too confused, and the point of views given showed things that had me questioning how the character could 
physically see those things, such as how could Dana see Willard getting arrested when she was at the front of the train falling off the bridge? It made no sense. I also felt like Dana's missing arm disappeared. Not her actual arm, obviously, but her having to work around only having one arm, like during the climax. Speaking of which, this book doesn't have a denouement. It's not so bad that we don't know what happens to all the players in the end, but it is strange to not get a sense of settling in the end. Even Beowulf has a denouement. I am a big fan of the denouement because I don't feel cheated when I reach the final page. That feeling is not as strong with the mere wife compared to, say, they're there, since the prose style was so poetic. It expanded my acceptance of differing medium techniques. Whereas, had the book been told with more traditional novel prose, I would have felt very put off by the lack of denouement. But overall, the book kind of lost me in the end. On characterization, when it's not overt, it is downright shocking. Willow was once shot and gave a woman an unwanted abortion. Ben killed a kid in a swimming dare. Diane killed Tina. Whoa, crazy and awesome. These are minor moments that just flit through the narrative. Major bombs of information dropped and forgotten. These were probably my favorite things in the book. These little dealt with monumental shops. It was also weird to me that Dana kept thinking that the people of Herod stole her land from her family and how her family had been there for generations. I kept thinking, this is the US, right? Is Dana white? Is she Native American? It felt like unintentional irony or missed opportunity. Opportunity. I also hated the group of mothers. They had so much power and bitterness. Them feeling like they were unappreciated was no excuse for controlling the lives around them. And Mula throughout the book resembles them more and more, which means I like her less and less. Now comes the big question. Did Willa know she was killing her son? It's up for debate. The book certainly suggests that it is possible. She pushed the crown further down his throat in the beginning of the book, so maybe she did. When she kills him, the book says she's sleeping when her attacker's heart stops. Is she? She's sleeping when she cuts out the heart. Is she? Is this a mouse? Is this her mouth? She licks her fingers. Does she? So the book bounces back and forth on the reality of her state of mind. Some brilliant person pointed out that most mothers know their children in the dark, but that Willa is so disassociated, her word, not mine, from her son that she doesn't. I don't know your name, brilliant person, but shout out to you from the Changing Hands First Draft Book Club. On every fourth Wednesday of the month. Come on down. Okay, I'm done shilling. And listen, they don't pay me for shilling. I just really like this event. So seriously, if you have a chance. Overall, I was torn while reading this. I was impressed by the language. I liked the themes, but I felt like these things and others sometimes got in the way of a completely engaging read. I felt like maybe one more draft, maybe two. I know that as a writer, you eventually just have to let go. I also know that sometimes it's hard to see these things when you've worked on on a piece for so long, eventually you become blind to flaws simply because you've become blind to the work. Mostly though, this is a good work. Again, it's hard to call it a novel, but maybe it was branded as such due to the fact that people don't buy epic poems and frankly never really have. But I will say this, the epic poem, despite what some academics have said, is not dead. It's also not completely a male art form. I think Hedley proves that the epic poem is alive and well, that people are willing to read them as long as that pill is disguised as a piece of bread and that women can write them and write them pretty damn well. Because I'll say this as well, it's better than some epic poems I've read for classes. What were your thoughts? Did you enjoy it? Did you hate it? If you read Beowulf, how did it compare? If you haven't read Beowulf, did you feel things going over your head? What did you think of the language? Did the book hold you the whole time? What did you think of the different character developments? Did you like or hate anyone in the book? Why? Do you believe that this is a novel or an epic poem? Do you think that Hedley wrote a good epic poem? Let me know in the comments below, but please mark all spoilers. This has been the Sunday Book Circle, and if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, share, subscribe, click that bell, leave a comment below, visit my blog at empatheticwriter.wordpress.com, and follow me on Patreon for exclusive content and a shout out on a video. Merch, 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 yeah. Check out my new shop at cafepress.com slash alexvaltrades for all kinds of products with my face on them.